old bills come from everywhere, handcuffed me into my car, took me to Brixton. So I took the lead from some good introductions. And I went down to Spain in 89, 90 from dad's introductions and opened up organized crime at a high level. They found copious amounts of cocaine and copious amounts of money. And I wasn't the organized crime, I was the crazy addict. There was two importations we were charged with. One was two and a half ton, which they drugged up in the fishing nets. And one was four and a half ton. I lost all my homes, all my businesses. I borrowed money off of people who were my friends, who come from a sort of fraternity of people that you've got to give the money back, and quite rightly so. Pay my, clear my name, which is being cleared. I'm very grateful for all the friends and family who supported me. My dirty soul got touched. Delighted to be in London and joined by Michael Emmett. Michael, thank you very much for taking the time. My and pleasure. pleasure to come see you today. And My pleasure. it's very much appreciated. So for those that don't know about Michael, he was sort of born into a criminal family. His dad was a career criminal. Michael ended up getting involved in the life and climbed to the very highest echelons and uh, got involved in the drug trade at very high levels. Um, he ended up getting convicted of some very serious drug cases. Um, and then during his final sentence, during a 12 year sentence, he ended up finding faith and finding the Lord. And then since then, when he'd been released the past 20 years, I've been on that journey on the right path. But um, we'll get into all of that. So, Michael, how are we? How is life? How are you doing? I'm okay, uh, Christian. Very nice to meet you. Um, yeah, life's different for me today. Um, I'm sort of in a, pro, uh, a progress of uh, sort of change. Um, not looking for perfection, uh, but looking to sort of establish myself in this life today without the sort of past behaviours, the the past involvements, my, my environment's different, the atmosphere is different for me. And I do a lot of work, you know, with um, uh, in prisons today. Um, I, I sort of, I have one or two people, I, 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 I sort of, they call it sponsor or mentor, you know, like-minded people who have come from a criminal background, who found faith or recovery. So I do a lot of that. I, I have um, I have a lovely big family, um, and yeah, I'm I'm doing one day at a time, and and life seems a lot better for me. I seem a lot more peaceful today. Mm. So, of all, I guess we like to go back to sort of the start of their journey to sort of see what developed them into the person they are today, Michael. So, to talk to us a little bit about your childhood, and like I say, from a big family, talk to us about the family settings okay. and sort of your dad, obviously, I'm guessing he had a big influence. Yeah. Well, my mum's family, um, she had five, there was, it was five of them. Uh, Peter, no, there was, uh, yeah, there was five of them. And um, my, my dad's family, he, he, had, he had three, three uh, sisters. He was, um, he, he, he was one of four children. So he got, he got brought up in a home with his uh, three sisters. His father, he was, um, I mean, they say that he got shot in one of the wars. He, he was a cripple. He's a very angry man, very bright man as well. And, and a lot of that stuff, I think, for me anyway, hence the name of the book, Sins of Fathers, it, it, it's that stuff that went on previous to my generations. And, and, and I say it because I know it, yeah? I, I've repeated things that my grandfather done and I've repeated things that my dad's done, not by being taught. Uh, it was just part of my being. Um, and I didn't ask for it. It, it, it impregnated in me, and it's not an excuse, but my challenge was to change it. And um, my mother's family, uh, sort of my grandparents, I, I think there was 11 or 14 or nine and 11 sort of children on my grandparents' side, my grandfather and my grandmother. So there was a huge family from South London. Um, 
my dad's, my grandfather on my dad's side and my grandmother, I didn't meet any of their family, but apparently there was four or five brothers as well. So on the whole, there's loads of us, yeah, and I don't know them all, but my own personal family, um, there was, uh, my father had seven children, yeah, uh, he had three or four, had four, four relationships, three marriages, um, I, I think he had more relationships than that, but the ones were, uh, uh, were important to him. Uh, so there were seven of us, you know, and um, we were very different how we got brought up. Sadly, his first three children, uh, he left their, their mother, Betty, she was a great lady, Betty, uh, and he met my mother, and, and, and they got left behind in South London. Not left behind, but their life became what their life was, and he met my mum and had three children with my mum, and he moved us out of the flats in Stockwell, down to Surrey, and... Uh, and I don't want to repeat, because these other podcasts I've done, so I don't want to make the story sort of monotonous, but this was my journey, yeah. Mm. So I was taken out of the flats. Um, there was sexual abuse that sort of formulated in me at a very young age. Um, I was in denial about that, but it, it created something in me that was very, very existent, yeah. Uh, and, and for me, it's the spiritual malady, yeah. It, it's the dysfunctional spirit. Uh, that the that the addict sort of gets confused about, uh, and and then the then the mind starts to play with you, and uh, I think and I've said it before, you know the mind is for per, uh, for practical things. It's about learning, it's about sort of being able to conduct yourself in a way that's acceptable. But I think the the the, the, the underpinning of the mind has to come from a clean soul, or a, I don't want to get too heavy here, or a clean heart. Mm. Uh, and, and mine were affected um, and I reacted in not a nice way to be honest with you because the manifestation of my own you know childhood abuse the the ancestral stuff that I believe came from my dad my grandfather and my dad my dad was a sort of a womanizer sex addict um, and that's nothing to be proud of um, but it causes complications um, it plays with your mind because you're doing things that you don't even like and people think oh that's a cop out it's not Addiction is a very cunning and baffling illness. It's an illness of the mind, you know, it distorts, it obsessives, it wants. And I think the addict mind, for me, is, um, it's not sort of getting what I want, say, like cannabis or cocaine or, or alcohol. It's about the wanting of it, the desire to change the way I feel, yeah? So that sort of hole in me, that was created from the abuse to, to seeing things with my dad. I saw a couple of bits of violence um, and they have an effect on, on kids. I'm not saying my dad meant it. Mm. We lived a lie without us knowing. There's a subconscious lie going on in the house because my dad was something, you know, he was betraying something that he wasn't. And you pick things up, you know, and, and I, sp I suppose so that side of it created, so let's call it the, dysfunctional monster really but it was also a nice pleasant kid in there who was um you know that opposite a mixture of an opposite so that pleasant young kid used to be kind to people you know i i always felt different at a very young age you know i i really thought i was going off my head at times at a very young age i'm talking about 11 and 12 and so you learn i mean they say that youth is wasted on the young because the, what you learn as a child if it's right or wrong, it, it still manifests itself to it becomes apparent to who you are. And, and there's no cop out, I'm just telling my story. Mm. And so I became the abuser, you know. Um, I, 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 was, I, I, was, I was volatile, I, I was angry, um, I, I used copious amounts of drugs, but copious, you know, I mean, I, I hit it hard. And, and so, there's, sorry to interrupt, what age was this you started taking drugs, Michael? Was this as a child? Well, no, I started drinking when I was about 11 or 12. Yeah. Not drinking, but my dad, my dad had a, a sort of drinking club in, in Ballon when we was kids. And so in, my, in our front room in, in our flat, we used to have this little bar, there was a few optics, and there was always people, back in the day, it was after like, after the few years after the war, it'd always be a sing song and it'd always be chaps ringing. And so there was quite a lot of, not outrageous, but it was always a little party going on in the house. So the smell of alcohol, and I used to get up in the morning when there'd been a party, 
and I, there'd be a dirty ashtray, which I love the smell of it, to be honest with you. And there'd be drinks scattered about the room what hadn't been drunk with my mum's lipstick on. There'd be like gin and tonics or whatever there was. So I, I was only six. And I used to, me and my sister used to take little sips of it. Mm. And that warm feeling. Now, I think we're born with addiction. Yeah, I think if we drink too much and we're not an, ad, an addict, then it's an habit. Yeah, but habits and addictions are completely different. Yeah, and, and they play havoc with you. So I started when I, I remember for, when I first got drunk. I was living in New Malden, and I drank a drunk a thing called a Party Four. Um, me and my mates over the over the park in Blagden Road, and I got badly drunk. I was sick as a pig, and but it, so even then I didn't have the knowledge because of the addict. They say one is too many. A thousand not enough so because you're constantly wanting more um, and so that's when it sort of formulated itself the dysfunction I started stealing at a very young age getting myself in trouble at a very young age started having a few little scraps and when I was in Surrey I'm going back to 1963 it, it wasn't what it is today you know it was quite sort of quiet New Malden High Street was like a small little village uh, everyone knew each other um, and, and then it sort of as the years have gone on it's expanded and then we moved down to Epsom when I was 16 and that, you know it's a number of years ago so it's like 45 years ago and New Malden was a lot of green belt I mean where we lived on the main road there there wasn't buildings and it was it was quite sort of open air it was open it was all grass everywhere and there was a number of buildings there I mean it, it wasn't remote countryside so I, I, there was this thing you know I understood we had a nice home. We didn't want for anything. We went on holidays every year as a family. So there was that going on. So I, I'm not saying it's only the environment that captivated my dysfunction, but it was in me and it was powerful. Mm. So there's a couple of obviously memories. You suffered a lot of trauma at early age. And like I say, your dad obviously consciously probably tried to move you out of the environment. Mm. The problem is when you've got the environment with him at home, it doesn't make any difference because you've got a criminal yeah. raising you but um you didn't mention the other podcast like what age or did you discover your, or know your dad was a criminal what age did you know about crime like you said you were stealing at an early age but what age were you aware when what? i was six yeah my old man we was we'd just come back from blooms which was a a, a jewish restaurant which all the chaps used to go to over in east london and we come back from there and um and i don't remember it vividly but what I do remember was the emotion and the fear. And what happened was my dad, we was coming around a one-way system at Vauxhall and a guy cut my dad up. Mm. And I do it now. My dad used to bite his tongue in anger mm. and I do it. So, you know, I don't know how I've got it. Maybe I copied him or what. But so I got that, that sort of anger, that, that frustration. And there's me and my sister... I'm not sure if Martin was uh, there. I think I don't think Martin was born, or, or, or that was my younger brother. Um, and my dad had this sort of road rage in this car. And when we got to New, when we pulled up outside the flats, the guy who had been chasing and arguing within the car drove past. So my mum got out with my um, sister. My mum left me in the car, thinking if I was in the car, dad wouldn't go. Shum! He's gone after him, and I was petrified. We didn't, I, we never caught him, but it went on for another mile or so. And I used to, I didn't realize that what that was, but it's funny our children, you just accept it. And then another time was, I see him have a fight. It was with his old mate, Arthur Sutty and his brother, Ted. Mm. And they, were, they had a fight up in Battersea Rise. They parked me round the corner. And um, it just, I said it the other day, it's like Sod's Lord of Geese that I had the fight with, come running round the corner and he fell against the car. And I was sitting in the back of the car and his face hit the, hit, hit the thing and it was bloody and, and I remember it. And I got really upset, I was frightened. I was about nine, eight or nine. The old man come running around the corner, something else went on. Anyway, was dad screaming and shouting and he got me out and he was tearful, you know. He said, son, I'm so sorry. So that, but as I've got older, you know, I've done it myself in front of my children. And, and, and it's something that I regret. Yeah, because you weren't pleased or proud or happy when you saw your dad do that. Like you say, it's a shocking no. moment for you. Yeah, it was frightening. And I think, I, I think if we get impregnated with fear, yeah, then the, 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 the fear is, it, it, it grows. It, it, it won't leave. Yeah. And you'd start to think on a fear-based personality. 
So the fear is gets, gets attached to pride, uh, ego, mm. control, manipulation, aggression. Uh, and when you're in that, it becomes your personality. And when you've got an addict as yeah. a personality, it encapsulates all those emotions and everything is extreme. The shouting. Yeah. You know, I was shouting as a five-year-old kid when I got abused in my head. Yeah. I didn't realise it until I'd done a bit of therapy. I was screaming to my mother in my head, where are you? And that went on for years. And when I was 40 years of age, or 35 years of age, still screaming and shouting, throwing a bottle or, or, or a book when you're four is okay, but throwing a bottle or a book in the same emotion when you're 40, it don't work. But it was impregnated in me. And the ones who suffered was, was my wife, Tracy. And, and, and she's one of my dearest friends today. She was the, she's been a backbone for me. They call her the rock of ages in the book. And she was incredible. And what I put that lady through, yeah, she saw the goodness in me, but we was high on drugs. Um, and, and we'll lead up to that. But it was so much that went on and, and it wasn't nice. Um, but she managed to, you know, she, she put up with me because she knew, bottom line is, that there was half a nice geezer in here. But that lady for me, Tracy, Tracy Bolton, Tracy Emmett, the mother of my children and the, and the grandmother of, of my seven grandchildren, I'm very blessed that she survived my, uh, my behavior towards her. Mm. She survived um, uh, our friendship, uh, you know, the, the dysfunction of drugs. Uh, she survived everything and she's still there as a backbone and I think that says a lot for her character and the goodness that she saw in me you know those without sin cast the first stone uh, you know and it's okay to judge when you don't know what you're judging I try not to do those things today and people in glass houses shoot and throw stones but for me it's about forgiveness for myself and Tracy's forgiveness has been incredible, mm. incredible. So then you go back to your childhood, you said obviously you saw your dad be violent a couple of times, but did you know your dad was actually involved in crime at this point, or you just see him, the problem is, did he shield you from his actual criminal activities? But the problem is you see, have an insight into the character where you saw him be violent a couple of times. Um, well, when I was a kid, I got nicked a couple of times, and, um, he sort of, there was about eight kids or 10 kids from Nick from my school, it's in the book. Um, and he had a bit of influence with, um, they say the geezer, he got nine years, he was a crooked cosser. Not that my dad entertained police, it, it was far from it. But everyone had sort of people were back in the day, it was organized crime. I think they all had a bit of help somewhere. I, I, I'm not saying that's true or not true, but my dad had a bit of help. Uh, and he got nine of us, we was Nick for violence as children at mm. 14. Um, and, uh, but when I was arrested, he was absolutely shocked and devastated. And, and because he didn't want me to be like him, so he didn't teach me crime. I remember another time, so listen, we weren't banging trouble, but there was a coser at Kingston Police Station, he was high ranking coser, and we got, I know the old man said, listen, they're gonna get criminal records here, do us a favor, and it weren't bad. So it wasn't probably a crooked coser, it was just an influencer saying, do you know what, these kids ain't done too much damage. But I met the coser before I went into the, into the police station, and what I thought about it afterwards, I was in Bentles with my mum and dad and him, and he was a big, he, he got nine years, this coser. He was ahead of the uh, the porn, the porn, you know, the pornographic stuff, the, whatever they call the sex. So, uh, yeah, he was up there with them all. He got nine years, this fella. Vice squad. The vice squad. And, and um, I think a number of them had him. I hope he's still not alive. I think he's dead, George. But I never knew him that well. But, you know, and, and so what was amazing about that, I met him in Bentles. An hour later, I'm in Ke uh, Kingston uh, Juvenile thing. And the guy who I've just been talking to in Bentles has come in the room. Now, I was wily enough and shrewd enough to not go, hold on a minute, I've just had a cup of tea with you in Bentles. And I think about that today. So I knew, keep your mouth shut. The house got raided a couple of times. Um, I've seen some, you know, I've seen my dad run through a plate glass window out in Spain. He nearly got killed. That added to the trauma. And then 
one day I went out into the um, garage at the back of our house in New Malden and he was making number plates and I was about 14. So the subconscious mind registered that because I knew that crooked number plates. So, and then there was always, we'd always used to buy crooked clothes, you know, off the oysters. And so I think it just got impregnated in me in a subtle way, mm. yeah. And I believe he was trying to come out of the crime world himself. He had a fruit business, he had pine shops, he had antique shops. But, you know, you can take the, uh, uh, the, the kid out of the street, but you can't take the street out of the kid. And, and I just think my dad was a, a career criminal. And, and as much as he might, he was a clever boy though. I must admit, he was a clever boy. Kept his mouth shut. Um, he was nicked, when I was very young, I think what had a, an influence on this, my old man was nicked for an armed robbery. And he was on the book in in, um, in Brixton. He was a county prisoner. And I went in there. Mm. And I remember visiting him behind the screen. I was only six, yeah. And and, and I remember standing here with my mum. Did you know it was the prison? Obviously, it's, it might sound like a silly question. Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah, I did. Because I didn't used to live far from it. In, in Brixton, in Jeb Avenue. Uh, and so it just, it formulates, you know, it, it just formulates. But I didn't think, oh, my dad's a big criminal. And then when I got into 16 and 17, I started to understand. Mm. And I remember meeting Eddie Richardson when he came out to Nick. I knew Freddie Foreman at a young age. And then, you you know, the notoriety of all that. I knew Joe Powell at a young yeah, age. Yeah, so that was going to ask that. Did your dad have his friends? Did you know his friends when it, you were growing up as a child? Did he bring his friends home, people like Joe Powell? Arthur Sutty and stuff like this with these in the house? Yeah, Arthur was. Uh, and there was a, there was a number of them who were. But my dad... What were these, like, what were your impression of these sort of figures at this time? Were these just sort of friendly uncle sort of like figures and you didn't yeah. know obviously anything more to that? You no. just saw the friendly, cuddly side of them? Well, there was a number of them who... See, the environment that we got brought up in, all our families, although there might have been one or two criminal heads in there, all the children, we all lived on the edge. So there was family communities that had normal lives, but we all knew about crooked MOTs and crooked this and crooked that. So a lot of the children I was growing up around in, not saying that their dad was hardened criminals, but there was a crime element to their life, that they would buy stolen goods and things like that. So as it evolved, my dad's, my dad's work people, yeah, at a very when I was younger, my dad got into a bit of fraud and all that, and they seemed to be a little bit, you know, I'm not saying that the gangsters were worse or better, but so there was an influence of sort of different criminals, and and then we would have our family friends like the Sutties. Um, there was a few other families that we were friends with. Um, you know, there's a number of families in Fulham. The, the, you have got uh, the, 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 the uh, Roy Dennis. So, and he was a mate of my dad's in Fulham. We knew Johnny Binden. Uh, there was the Donovans over there. There was the Hazes over there. And they all weren't hardened criminals, but they knew how the roses grow. So you, you bought up with them. And then I started meeting all the great train robbers when they come home. Gordon Goody, Charlie Wilson, uh, Buster Edwards. And so I knew who they was. So without me knowing, it just probably evolved. And it was a nature to me. So now he's getting into your teenage years then, what were your aspirations then as an adult? What were you hoping to be? What were your desires and dreams in life at sort of 13, 14 years old? What was, I know you're getting in little bits of bobs of trouble at this time, but did you have any sort of aspirations? Yeah, my, my sister was very bright. She was very extremely bright. And so was my younger brother. Um, and so was my dad. Whether I had dyslexic or whether it was a, a, a spiritual or emotional problem, I couldn't concentrate in school. But I excelled at sport. I wasn't a champion, but it was one stage I thought I could be a professional football player. I went through that for a year. Um, I was a quick runner. I could swim. So I developed a sportsman in me. Um, but the, the, the destruction came very quickly and I got fogged out probably at about 15. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so everything was a blur for many years, Christian. And I think I got on the treadmill, yeah? So everything had to have a fix. There was no foundation. It, everything had to be fixed. I had to be high, I had to be here, I had to be with that woman, I had to be this woman, I had to do that, I had to be with that guy. And my life became sort of, uh, you know, I was like just traveling around in life as if I, I was a rule unto myself. But what I was doing was putting masks up 
because I didn't want to know how anyone how I was feeling because I, I, I thought I was mad. Mm. And I really did, I thought I was mad. It's no excuse for me to survive it could only be by something greater than me. But so my aspirations then, and then once I got at it, my aspiration was in So you say you're sort of 15 years old, you're out of school and stuff like this. Were there any law abiding jobs straight away or anything like this? Or was it literally <laughs> straight involved into the life of crime? Obviously you had been committing yeah. crime prior to getting thrown at 15. Yeah, well I left school when I was 16, 16. 17. Okay. Um, so I attempted to, uh, I went to the job centre and um, I attempted to get a job in a carpet shop in Malden, but I got on the bus there and, uh, and come home. And my mum said, what happened? I just think I told a lie. It was, I just made it up because I, my dad wanted me, because my sister used to do paper rounds. I mean, I had paper rounds as kids and things like that. And then my old man said, you know what? Come and work with me. So him and Arthur Sati, great man Arthur. He was like, he was like Dean Martin, he was a lovely man Arthur. And him and my old man used to have a commercial pitch up in Battersea. And my dad and Arthur was from Battersea, everyone knew him there. So I went to work with my dad on the car front when I was 17. And that's what I started doing. How did you take to that? Were you a good salesman? Gift of gab? So I was like, just sound a, like you got it today. Yeah, I was just a naughty boy. Like I, had, I had an egg round. My mother had a calf on the other side of on Battersea Rise. I used to open the calf for her. I used to help. Arthur was my mate. My dad was... Uh, he was so strict with me, my dad. He used to give me £20 a week and charge me a nicker a week because I used to come up with him in the car. And uh, so I used to nick petrol out of vehicles, no. um, driving illegally. But I had so much fun in that yard with Arthur Sati. I mean, just one funny story. He knew I was nicking the cars. Anyway, one day there was a, a builder's merchant opposite and the lady who worked in there, she had a Mark Olden Morris 1100. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the indicators used to come out the side like that. And there was them little FS keys and it belonged to the bird. And all of a sudden he went to me, God, the old man's bought you a car. He said, but don't go out in the road, drive it up in the yard. Knowing full well it belonged to the bird, he's come out with me, started it with any key. All of a sudden I've driven off down the yard, he's wet himself laughing. The birds come running out. This was the life with Arthur, it was fantastic. She's chasing me down the yard. She's, Michael, Michael. So she's come up to the car. It was maroon, this car. I had all the, I had all the um, indicator. I thought, this is great, this car. Little big steering wheel here, a, a, a gear change. Big holes, the bib. She come up, she went, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? Oh, whatever. I said, I can't remember what I said. I said, this is my car. I said, my dad just bought it for me. She said, it's not. She said, it belongs to me. Now, them pranks. So you start to have fun. I had a crooked MOT book. Mark, I used to say. So there's some mischievous influences at that point. Oh, mind you guys. Big time, especially with Arthur. He thought it was hilarious. I used to love being with Arthur because he, he used to always take me out to lunch with spaghetti bolognese. He'd say, Come with me. He got me a crooked MOT book. And then he used to say to me, When all the lorries come in, he said, Nick the spare wheel off it and the jack. So when we're s selling the lorry, I'll shout out, Michael, have you got a spare wheel for a TK Bedford? You got a jack? It was the only, it belonged to the vehicle that I'd taken out of. I said, yeah, I've got something here, Arthur. He said, oh, the kid's got a spare wheel and a jack. How much you want, really? I said, I'll take a tenner, Arthur. And he used to say, build me wages up. I had the MOT book. Um, there was always stolen goods coming in there, like Slazager jumpers and... Um, you know, training. It was all stuff going on so I could build my wages up and I had an egg round. Mm. And so you very much gained their trust at these points here, didn't they? Because they started yeah. allowing you to do more and more bits for them yeah. at this point here. And um, was Joey Paul Senior on the scene with your dad and Arthur at these times? Or was it... Yeah, I mean, what happened? Joe came on the scene. I mean, I'd know, I knew about Joe when I was a young man because we, we never used to live far from Joe. And when Joe got into the fights, because my dad got into the fights with him as well, up in uh, the Dog and Fox. And uh, my dad had other partners, and then him and Joe come together for a while. Uh, Joe was the prominent one in that, my dad weren't, but he, we had a few shows up in Wimbledon Village, we had some great times. And um, so I used to go over to Joe and his brother Ted, they used to have a car front over off the uh, Old Kent Road. 
Uh, I can't remember now, he's on the left hand side there. So I might take, they'd say, oh, we sold a car to Joe or we bought a car off Joe. And I'd be sitting in the car when I'd go over there and there'd be Joe, Paul, Ted, the old man, Art of Sati, there'd be a couple of faces all having tea, all laughing and joking. So I'd been brought up around that, you know. And so, yeah, I knew Joe probably when I was about 18, 19. Yeah, and being around all these sort of characters must have just sucked you into the life. Like, mm. you obviously weren't repelled by it, and it had the opposite effect. It was just an attraction to you. Very much and, so. And so, your, your daddy was he? Didn't he have sex shops and stuff at these times? The yeah, smell. early days, I was involved with the sex shops. Um, with um, in the West End years and years ago. I mean, he was. I, I'm not sure if he was on. I think he definitely was involved. He weren't on the peripherals. There was three or four of them involved, and I used to go over there with um, a guy. Uh, not all the time, but I, I, I used to love it. Going in the sex shops yes. and drawing a bit of dough and giving them a bit of dough. And my young, my older brother Brian was involved. There was a couple of good faces involved. So it all sort of became glitz and glamour and. And then I started working with the old man, he had a long firm, and then I got my own car, and I started to leave the commercial business behind, and, um, and I got at it myself. So it must have been very intoxicating for a young man, all the power and the oh, success I loved it. and everything. It's a buzz at them times there, if you didn't know what you had to come down the line, Ooh. unfortunately. And so these times here, were you taking drugs and drinking a lot, as well as obviously the, all the women and stuff? The booze became, um, I started, I had a couple of puffs when I was about 17, because it wasn't like it was it nowadays. I mean, I suppose people might have started younger, I never 17, but at the beginning it was drink for me, um, up until I was about 19. Then I started taking a bit of coke when I was about 20, and that was it for me, that, that was the uh, devil's dandruff for me. Um, and I tried to control it. I, 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 I started earning bits and pieces out of it. Uh, but then it just, it, it, I think when we have trauma, because trauma speaks, if we don't take care of trauma, and, and, and trauma can, it, it, do you know what trauma does go into a lot of self-pity? Oh, woe is me. And I think to understand that, uh, and I think I've got a gift of understanding it, because I'm clever, because I went through it, that's what I like to do with people now, I really get into their trauma, because I find it very sad, that's why I don't judge no one, you know. And uh, so around about that age, I started sort of messing about with women. I was, I was, I was disloyal, unfaithful from a very young age. And I treated women really bad, you know? And they're all my friends today, so I must have done something right. But I was just, you know, I hurt girls, and I'm not proud of that. And it's something I have to check even today. Um, but yeah, so drink and then cocaine come, and. And then crime took off, and before you knew it, I was up and running. Mm. So you, your dad and Joe ended up getting involved with the mafia, the American mafia at a certain point, and the drugs started coming to the scene, then they ended up, obviously import, and ended up going out yeah. to Spain, and you ended up sort of following at a very young age, didn't you? Well, I w wouldn't... So what, age, what age did you go out to, to Spain, or what age did this get involved? Or? Well, I think with me dad and Joe, yeah. I'm not trying to say it's the mafia who instigated it, because I was thinking it's strange that the American Mafia would be controlling... Well, it was... Yeah. It, they were at that time. They were that powerful at that point there. That they were well, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but what I do know, that there was a club in the West End called the Steering Wheel Club. Well, I used to go over there. Um, they was all friends of Joe and Dad through Alex Steen. So I don't know what influence they had, but my dad and Joe met them all through a guy called Wazzle. So Joe Pagano and all them family members, young Joe, I tell you. But what came out of it, I would say, was an introduction. And I won't say the names, but they was, I wasn't saying that they instigated the move, but, you know, arms stretch over the water. So I wouldn't say my dad's partners were the five families, but I do believe there was a sort of few favours and introductions made out of that. But you, they must have very much respected your dad and Joe must have been very much Premier League criminals in order for the, either to be accepted or to even work with them to be serious enough to be. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, bro, Joe was a, you know, Joe was a very unusual man. Joe was a very, he gave a lot of himself to a lot of people. He really was very helpful to people in prisons, and and Joe looked the part. He sounded the part. He had a lot of respect. My dad was like his his nutty partner who was a little bit. You know, Dad was a little bit crazy, you know, 
And also, Dad was very weak as well around women like I was. So when they went out to the States, there were some funny stories went out there. You know, they was kissing the Godfather's hands and all things like that. I don't think the old man liked that too much. But there was a lot of respect for Joe and the old man. And then it all started. It, it, it started... So I don't, I'm not sure where... But I can't tell you, I'm not going to lie to you, uh, where the, where the uh, connection came... But I would, I would honestly say that there was an influence from out there to here. And, it was, and they, was, they was bang at it, Joe and the old man, smuggling cannabis at a very, very early years in the cannabis uh, sort of industry. Yes, I mean, there wasn't very many people bringing in big loads at that time, no, was it? it was, I don't think so. It's not like today where there's thousands of drunk dealers. It was, uh... Yeah, it's not like it is today. I'm not sure what it's like today, but it, it was very sort of, um, it was 80s. It was a Lebanese thing. It was regular. Um, they had their sort of ha they had their bead on it, and I started meeting a few of them. You know, when I mentioned the steer uh, the steering wheel club up in the West End, in um, in Knightsbridge it was, and I used to go up there. I used to love it, and they, they had an illegal uh, gambling den. Proper Americans. It, it, that was influence from out there, and I used to go up there. I used to get them a little bit of. Uh, I used to do one or two favors for them. Oh, I loved it. Hey Michael, you know that sort of thing, and then I was gonna when I was wanted, they was gonna send me out to young Joe. I remember the geezer's name. I think his name was Jimmy, his big fat geezer, and um, I was gonna go and stay with him on a ranch in California, and um, he, he somehow disappeared. This guy, and um, so there was that sort of it was heavy, you know. And I never went there. I, I went out to Spain. I was wanted. I was in a bad car crash with a car chase with police. Mate of mine, I went on my toes. Um, I went down to Marbella when I was about uh, I was about 23, 24. So talk to me about life in Spain then. What's how it was when you got out there? You must have absolutely loved it. Your own son, you're a young man in your prime. And talk about life in Spain in Marbella, the places, glitz and glamour. Well, Marbella in 1984 was so romantic. It was the port was the port. Oh, the Marbauer Old Town was the Marbauer Old Town. All the chaps, the good chaps were there. So there's a bit of help for me. So I went down there. But, but the mental illness had started. Yeah, the mental illness had really kicked in. I was in a very heavy uh, car, uh, car chase with the police. I, that sort of, I got damaged, damaged legs from that. A mate of mine was really hurt. And so when I went out to Marbella, there was that flick in me of, yeah, like, and he'd say, oh, you're here, Brian, son, he's all right, and Joe, and that's it, we look like Michael. I've got little apartments to stay in. I've got a few little leg-ups. I went to graft myself down there as a young kid messing about, nicking a few quid. And um, and so, yeah, it was great. It was wine, women, and song, but I had my, my wife, well, my, Tracy was at home with Amy. Amy was only 18 months. So there was that conflict of interest in me. And as much as I was a womanizer and as a druggie, my conscience was never clear. I always, had a, I always knew what I was doing was wrong. That might be a cop out to some people. But when you had the addict that I had, and I'm not saying mine was worse than anybody else, quite control mm. my emotions. And so what was it that you were actually doing out there at Spencer? Were you working for your dad, sort of watching no. the times come through? Were you involved in the drug trade yourself on a separate note? I just started messing about with a little bit of puff and, and getting a few quid out of that. I sort of was sort that selling it out there or was that sending it back to England? No, it never got that big. I used to, uh, I was only a little bits and pieces and I used to go down to France and mess about with only a little very minute bit. But it used to get a bit of wages for me. Just driving it down there, so a bit of transport. Well, I wasn't the transport, but I used to sort. I, I, I yeah, I used to get involved and, and get a few quid out of it. So the problem is, you sort of landed on your feet with your dad's sort of connections and the people you knew from your family so. and stuff, and so it's just so easy for you to sort of fall into the. Very much so. I mean, they they was connected very well down there. It was old Jackie Kramer, lovely man Jack. Freddie Foreman was about there. Fred was very kind to me. I've known Fred for many years. Um, yeah, it's a bit like the heyday of the sort of English criminal yeah. out there. That's the real Costa del Crime like sort of times. And um, 
was this time when Fred had a country club? Was it a country yeah. club out there? Yeah. And that looked like some fantastic times. Did you spend time there? Yeah, I went there, but I, I sort of left as Fred got that. He used to have it with a guy called Eddie Ayoff. Yeah. He was the, um, I think he fought for the light heavyweight championship or bit or for the eliminator. He bought, he, he fought Bob Foster. Mm. Uh, we wind up having, I wind up having a fight with him. He broke my nose. It's oh, kicked up. He, he, it was my brother and that, uh, young Adam and Francis, and I, they, all the chaps was in the in in a place called the Artola. They used to go there on a Sunday and have some lovely food, and and everyone used to have a bit of a game and that. All the young girls used to be there, and there was an argument with me and my brother. We never used to argue, me and him, bless his heart. And then something happened, and um, Eddie, uh, someone got chinned. Fred come out and all that said, "You can't do this, Michael. You know we could get in trouble." Um, and Eddie started hitting people, the young kids, and he was knocking them about. So I said, I'll fight you. And they stood up to have a sort of semi straight with him. I had more chance than, than pigs flying. He caught me with a blow. I think he bought it from the Welsh Valley. And he went wallop. And he hit me on the nose. It broke me out, gave me two black eyes. And he was from Wales, this guy. And as I fell over, he'd already knocked the other three on the floor. Someone shouted out, Wales four, England nil. So I got up and Fred was going, look, you know, just leave it. But I weren't leaving it and I sort of steamed into him. And uh, I, I, I sort of jumped on him and so he got a kick up the orcas, up the balls. There was a bit of scruggling going on, but we, we, we were sort of, we definitely finished second on the day. So Fred was there and, and, he, and he called me round to see me, Fred, with all them, all his mates. They were lovely, Ronnie Everett, uh, I think John Mason. There was a number of them. They was Ronnie Knight. They were really sweet guys. You know, they. I'm not saying they run the show. I don't want to put anything on them, but obviously you've seen Marbella stuff. So they had an influence down there. Mm. And there was the treaty that you couldn't be sprung out of there before 83, I think it was. But if you get in trouble, as an undesirable, you can go. So Fred was concerned about that. And he made a meet with me with Eddie Ayoff. He arranged it all. And I wanted to smash Eddie over him. I mean, Eddie's a lovely man, and um, because he hurt my brother, and um, and he hurt me. But Fred said, "You know what? Whatever Fred said." So he got straightened out. But it was quite a, a comical fight. And then I started to get myself in trouble a little bit down there, drinking, taking drugs, and then something really, really tragic happened to me down there with my younger brother. Mm. So talk to me about what happened. Obviously, uh, there, there was a car crash unfortunately your yeah. brother wasn't it so um yeah. and you were literally with him he was with you staying would you talk to us about that yeah. event if you could yeah um, of course christian yeah well it's it's a it's, it's it's an event that i hold in my heart it's event it's an event that on top of all the trauma that i went through i felt i'd been hit by a you know a locomotive train um and it was the fear-based character that I was, but you couldn't see that because I was a man of many masks. I looked the part, sounded the part, but I was very broken. And it's no excuse because my actions do not justify my brokenness because I had no right to hurt Tracy, women, I've had affairs, um, I've lost people's money. That was an accident. That was, I was safe with money. And every one of my debtors would get paid every one of them because they're family and friends yeah but it was tough for me so martin um how <laughs> bless his eye we're not a lovely kid he's a very special young man his son he never met his son his son beautiful charles who's got he's got a famous mother actually she's an artist uh, he's got brothers and sisters now charles the burns family jack joseph and ella they're wonderful um, he has a, he has his own children today, Charles. So it's it's ended well. But at that particular time, losing Martin was like losing an angel. What, yeah. age, what age was he, Michael? Twenty one. Jesus. And what had happened? We was having words. He, he wasn't a big user, Martin, but he used to like a puff. He liked a glass of champagne and have a little bet. But he was very intelligent, very bright, very funny, very kind, and that was his personality. Thank God he didn't get what I got. But he, um, we'd been out one night with another great friend of ours who sadly passed away. He was sort of related to my dad. There was all the chaps there, everyone was doing their thing. And we wound up on the cocaine. And we went home. He'd left his passport at my pal's house and he'd come home with me. 
that I, I, there's a there's a point to the passport. So when we got indoors, we started. We was agreeing to disagree about my dad and this woman that he was seeing, and and bless the woman he was seeing because he had a child with her. But at that particular time, it was very hard, and it was the it was the breakdown of the. My and my mum and dad, and my brother and sister. We was a very close union. As much as we had the influence of crime. There was also a massive influence that my mother was a very, very special lady and she run her home according, accordingly to love. So everything she done was done in love. So that opposite of the volatility of Brian, what came through was the love of Jean. So my brother and sister, they sort of got on all right. <laughs> but he was our baby. It, you, you wouldn't hear, you, you hear some funny things about me, good and bad, um, but with my brother, no, with my mum, no, and they were really, really unique people. I, I think in my spiritual move in life today, I got, ver I got shown at a very young age what love means. So when we was arguing this night about my dad, I went to bed and um, he was angry, so he said, I'm going. And he left and he walked down to the ball ring at Marbella, which is a long way, he must have got a lift. I got in the car, went and got him, bought him home. He said, I want some money, I'll give him a few quid. And I thought he'd go to bed. Anyway, he's left, right? And I've heard the car screech. I thought, oh. And he off, he's gone. He went round to my pal's house, my pal's door was open. He got his passport. He come back, and it was a moment that he come back. And this is very, very sad. He wrote on a big shaving mirror, I love you. And two guys I know cut that mirror off. I've still got it. Well, I can't find it at the moment. I've had it 33 years. He drove to Malibu Airport. It was his destiny, I believe. Is that... It was his destiny, I believe. And he got to Malibu Airport. So if my mate's door weren't open, he wouldn't have got his passport. If I don't give him the t car, he comes home. He gets to Malaga Airport, phones my mum. Can't get his money in. So it's, it's second by second that life could be so different from him. But yeah, that was his destiny. Mm. Why? I'll never know. And he come back from Malaga Airport, coming back to me. He went underneath a lorry. It was, they say it was one of the... And I, I, I don't want to say how bad it was, but it was terrible. There was nothing off the kid. It was terrible. And the only thing I got to see afterwards was part of his face. They covered him up. My dad arrived. He was dead. I couldn't believe it. And it was the... It was like as if it was a punishment for me. It was... A, you, you re, I, di, I didn't deserve that. But the energy of fear, I believe, has a big effect on our lives. Mm. The energy of fear. That's why the energy of faith can change you, I believe. So he died and friends of mine went and identified him. Sadly, one of them don't, you know, whatever, there was been a bit of a mix up there, but he was very kind to me, a guy. And he's a very lovely man, this fella. And he, he went and identified my brother, him and two guys. One was the guy whose house we went into and there was another guy. They cut the mirror, got the mirror for me sorted everything out, I'm waiting for my dad. My dad arrived with Art of Sati and lovely Tracy again. Bless you, Tracy, she's a wonderful woman, Tracy. Mm -hmm. I thank God for Tracy. And we went and see him, my dad tried to get him out of the coffin. Oh, he wanted to hold his boy again for the last time. And they weren't having it, he was in a terrible state, the boy. We got to kiss his forehead, they locked the coffin down. And in two days after that, while we was down there, Art of Sati's Art was he got spun and he was nicked, I think, with Paul Ferris. I think it was with Paul Ferris. And so Arthur's now on his toes. I'm on my toes. My dad and Tracy, bless Tracy and my dad, they, they take the body back to England. And in two days after my, three days after my brother died, my mother's father died. So my mum buried her dad and her son. Now this is heavy, tragic stuff. No wonder I got affected. But it don't justify my behaviour. And so I was wanted by the police. We come back, me and me and Arthur. I suppose I could have got a five or a six or a seven or something like that. 
I got nicked. We we buried Martin. I got nicked. I was having an argument in a in the car park at Aaron's. Old bills come from everywhere. Handcuffed me to my car. Took me to Brixton. And I went to trial. I was on remand. I got three not guilties, which I should have done, really. You know, listen, I'm not saying I'm an angel and I don't do crime, but this one I was not really... What was the charge at the time? Well, at a particular time, I think they found my charge, my charge was um, a possession of cocaine, but they had no evidence on that because it weren't mine. And I threw an ounce. Oh, this the ounce that got thrown in the yeah. car. Yeah, so they said to me that it was a fleeting possession. I didn't know what it was, but I still handed it. It was a lot of nonsense. Yeah. But I had bigger charges that they couldn't prove. Got three or four not guilties, and then Judge Paling gave me, she only gave me 18 months, but she should have let me go out of court. I'd already done seven months on remand. But you know what? I was looking at five or six years, uh, and I got 18 months. I got four not guilties, and, and it still weren't enough. You know, mm. I just wanted to get, as soon as I got out of the nick. So you hadn't changed, didn't have a hard time in jail or anything like this? Talk to us about your time in jail then. So it didn't, was it enough to put you off crime then? No, nah, it was a walk in the park. I quite enjoyed it, Brixton. Then I went down to Did so you know a few fellas in there as well? Yeah. When I was in Brixton, there was uh, Brian Reader who, who just who got nicked for the Atten. Yep. Brian Reader knew Brian. I never knew him, Kenny Noy, but he was upstairs. There was a lot of young chaps I knew in there. There was uh, Alan Stanton, he was nicked for an armed robbery, who I knew. Alan Trotter, God rest his soul. There was a number of people in so there. So like the way you'd been living for the previous and the way you'd been raised, you sort of fitted in perfectly. Yeah, I was cool. Perfectly. I was cool with it. Got myself in a little bit of trouble. I was banged up with a mate of mine, God rest his soul, Clifford. I was like banged up with him for six months. All we'd done was got stuck. You could drink in the nick then. You could have some beer and some vino. We'd get stoned every day. <laughs> Was having getting drunk, having a laugh, playing. Oh, no bang. wonder you didn't mind it. That was fantastic. Hey. <laughs> when you used to get your drink, you used to have a visit every day, and then they'd give you a drink. So they used to put, they get the can, of, tin of cans, open them, and put a little bit of uh, rice paper on the top, and then you get your bottle of Matus, yeah. little bottle of Matus, and then you go. It was like a little bar where you used to get your. Sounds drink. like the good fellas scene that you. That was fantastic. Then. My God, uh, no wonder you weren't put off the life then. And so, no. unfortunately, you've come out after, you've done seven months of remand, so you've got 18 months. What did you do, another I think six months or something? Something like that. I think something like that. It was the greater of the two. And I went down to East Church, got down to Ford. There was Joey Wilkins in Ford, one of the chaps. Um, there was a number of chaps in there, people out of Croydon, people who knew me dad. Mm. And that was just like an holiday camp, really. So what were your intentions then while you're in jail, thinking about what you're going to get up to when you got out? Obviously, it wasn't anything legit, but what were you, what were you thinking then? Just carry on with the life and let's see what presents itself. Uh, I'm not sure whether we have the capacity to think at that particular time. I was, I was fueled with drugs, um, but I, I had the intention of not being naughty again. And... Uh, I came out, Martin had died, I went to prison and I started seeing a, a young lady who was a very dear friend of mine. Um, I knew her boyfriend, she was my wife's best friend and, and, and I think the pain and the heartache, this is not to justify it, and she was a beautiful soul, this girl, Jane. I, had an, I started going out with her, it caused nothing but heartache. In the interim period I now had three children, three wonderful children who are my life. I humiliated my wife, I humiliated her. Um, her and Jane are friends today. Uh, it was awful, it was awful, it was addiction, it was, it was a, I was gone. And I had a breakdown, I had a breakdown. I could not cope with the power of this addict. Um, I never went to doc the doctors, in fact, I went back to Tracy. She sort of helped me come off of what was going on. She was giving me Valium, I was in a terrible state. But she got the brunt of it, that girl. And I adore her. Mm. She's very dear to me. So what was it that made you sort of um, have the... It was either commitment issues or the self-destruct sort of issues or the... Because there's something behind it. It wasn't literally a case of desire for women. There's got to be some more ingrained thing that made you sort of self-destruct with your yeah. relationships. Like, what was that at that point there? Was it a commitment? <coughs> you did like settle down or you... Um, you're not sure even at this point today? No, I am sure. I just want to give you the answer, good answer. Um, I think because my mind was mad, 
my heart was always good. Mm. I didn't want anyone to see who I was. So the promises that came out of my mouth, I was a people pleaser. I was good at crime. I was, I was game as a buyer. Well, that's no self praise, I was. Um, but the sabotage, I never felt good enough from the abuse as a child, from the, from the, the, the sort of makeup of Charlie and Brian that was in me. It was very sabotage. It was very, I was, I was her. And that doesn't give me the right to go around hurting other people. Mm. But everyone I hurt talks to me today, barring, well, but anyway, it, it was, because I was a character, I was a lovable rogue. But I was so, I mean, I couldn't understand it. No one else could. Yeah. It, it, was, it was a dual, it was a yin and yang. It was a dual. So maybe point. it was a case of, like you said, you'd been, had you suffered abuse as a child, yeah. never dealt with the trauma in the no. correct way, and so then you ended up abusing and being destructive on the outside because you hadn't managed to deal with the demons, obviously being fueled and shadowing it with drink and drugs That's for hours. So until you can address those things, it's. Mm. And so you carried on. So like you said, Tracy took you back, and so Tracy mended you during these times after the breakdown. Well, we didn't go back with each other, but I think she, she was like a nurse. She was like kind. She loved me and I loved her, but we just didn't. And it weren't only me with Tracy. We just we didn't connect. Um, and I and I loved her, and, and I, uh, it was a love hate relationship. But when I went home with my towel between my legs, she medicated me for about three months. We kept it to ourselves. She put me on Valium, and slowly. And then I got up one day. And uh, she said, I think it's time you left. Uh, and I wanted to go. And Brian invited me, my dad, to go out to Spain. Uh, and that's when the next sort of, um, I got myself well, about six months. And that's when I left home. And uh, I know it sounds crazy, but I was a, I was a complete warrior. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I missed so much beauty. I missed... My children, I mean, I adored my children, but I was so confused that I didn't know how to love my children. I, it was in my heart. So I used to just give them stuff, just give them stuff. But today they're, they're very special to me and my kids today. And they were then. And I went out to Spain in, in 89, I think. Mm. And so talk to me about what your dad was up to in Spain then and what you ended up falling into. And, and yeah. where about to Spain? Was it back to Marbella? Back to my back. Well, my dad and Joe got arrested at the end of the 80s. They both got out of it, quite rightly so as well. Uh, they was arrested, I think, for eight or hundred key or, or a ton of puff. But they went to party in their ways. I think the other people had to rave it up with them. Uh, and funny enough, they, 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 not that I'm into it all, but there was a post come up about uh, a book today on this gangster thing on Facebook. And I've undone it. And it's about my dad and Joe Pyle being top targets. And I thought, oh dear. So anyway, um, you know, they were, I suppose the drug game wasn't really rife then. It was getting itself, it was, it was momenting. And so dad and Joe went their own ways. Dad sort of, I think they both, not retired, but they were told, behave yourselves because you're going to get it. So I took the lead from some good introductions. And I went down to Spain in 89, 90 from dad's introductions and opened up uh, organised crime at a high level. I don't want to get into it too much. I can only get into the bit I got nicked for. But, you know, to build up that sort of thing, obviously we was, it, it didn't just fall out of the sky. Mm. But it was very organised crime with, with very organised people. I fitted the bill. Mm. So I hid myself in that. I hid my... Uh, and this was in the hash trade then, so... It's the hash trade, yeah, yeah. in the cannabis trade. And still still working with the Lebanese or the Moroccans? As no, well, the Moroccans had got involved by now. And, uh, and, and, and it was a sort of operation that was... Uh, well, it, it became massive. And so, um, and I don't mean that sort of massive as like, look at me. I can completely understand. Like I said, the people who introductions, the people you sort of followed on for, were doing it at such a level anyway that it wasn't um, mm. going to go backwards, was it? And I've been prepared, I think, from the younger days of messing about with a bit of few drugs and then messing about in Spain. So, and the people I've been around. And do you know what, Christian? Yeah. When I think back and think about it, I stepped up to the plane mm. and I and I thought. 
I've arrived. And obviously it's never a good thing we don't try and put people into this life, but back at them times there, that was really the golden days of the yeah. Spain and all that. Oh. I mean, today it's a very much different place. It's very dangerous there today. There's obviously lots of Russians. Moroccans are super violent now. Mm. Different, like the Dutch Moroccans. Everyone, yeah. Everyone's got in this lot of... Uh, Mafias and cartels that now sort of control. I don't know anything about it. No, I, I don't. I know this yeah. from just reading. I don't yeah, know me this, too. I don't know this from personal experience. Thank yeah. God. Yeah, yeah. But at that time there, how dangerous was it out there? How, no, with the relationships you had with the Moroccan is all good. It was lovely. We become sort of business friends. Mm. So I read what you read, and when I read it and I see it on the, and I go, God, oh dear. I mean. They, they, there's shootings going on down there, there's all sorts of things going on down there, what you see on the news. And for me, it was never that. Yes. I, I, when I was out there, I, I met a, a lady, who, who, and so I lived with her, um, and she was good for me at that particular time. Um, I, I still had this thing about Tracy and the children, and I couldn't really commit to this girl, although it was a way she was a very kind lady, but so Tracy and the kids was in the background. The kids was coming out to see me. I, I had I had a home out there. I had a business out there. <coughs> Excuse me, I had a straight business out there serving bars with crisps. And then the production, sort of the illegal stuff was, the illegal stuff was why I went there. We worked to sell crisps. And so I started getting involved and um, we built it up to, uh, you know, uh, a lot of cannabis but it was never violent it was never no trouble everyone trusted each other and it's really funny two days ago i was walking down knightsbridge and i see the the transports the guy who used to do the transport i see his son sitting there. i ain't seen him for 30 years michael he went i said how are you nice kid i mean he was only a kid at the time he wasn't really involved but i met him because his dad was our transport and so it all just sort of you know it went from strength to strength, but very quickly. Hmm. Did you go out to Morocco to tour? Did you ever go yeah. to Morocco? And how was it going out there at those times? Like, it was sweet. We used to have a way of getting in there. Um, I loved it. I loved Tangiers. And I wasn't loving it because I was going to do naughty stuff. I loved the environment. I loved the Casbah. I loved their way of life. Um, and I had influence there. It was. Uh, uh, and the people I was introduced to as well, there was a lot of people down there. A very good friend of my father's, uh, he's, his name's Bob, um, and he, his ex-wife was down there. I won't say her name, but she was with the sort of uh, aristocrat people out there. There's a lot of influence up on the Rift Valley, and they would have bridge clubs. Uh, backgammon clubs. Really? Fantastic. Yeah, they were, a lot of them were English. Mm. So I used to go over there uh, and, and I used to gravitate to them. Very posh. I used to get into backgammon and then oh, well, I invite Michael for lunch and all that. And um, a lot of them were sort of, I'm not against any people's sexual uh, things, but there was a, a lot of gay community there. Not all of that. You wouldn't so, believe that out there, somewhere like that in a Muslim country. Yeah. But, yeah. but they, they, and they loved it. I mean, they bought colour there. They bought influence there. They bought England there. And a lot of them, because where they were was on the Medi. But if you go up and turn on, I forget the name of the place now, it turns into the Atlantic. And a lot of them had summer houses down there where they'd have growing sort of mango trees and there'd be all lovely fruits. And they'd be right on the beach uh, 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 um, on the Mediterranean, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, the Atlantic side. And I'd go down there and play backgammon, swim. We'd have nice fish. And there was a mixture of people, artists, poets, um, rejects, lovely people, gay people, straight people. It was just, and it's not, it's not a class thing, gay, a, nothing at all. Uh, but so I had the fun, I had great times with them. And, uh, and, and so I got carried away there. You know, you know, my addict was a bit delusional at the time. I, I was playing the part, I was, you know, and it worked because I was at the, at the trick there. It, uh, you know, smuggling it. I was enjoying it. Sounds fantastic. I had great fun. I used to go to the bars and have fun, and and I and I was looked after. The, the, you know, the people we was introduced to were were, were, were premier. Hmm. So it sounds fantastic. Like I said, you've gone out to Spain in '89, and so eventually, obviously, with all these criminal pursuits, things go wrong. And so 
talk to me about when, what sort of year was this that things, was it 92, 93? Yeah, I think I got nicked in, uh, they said that I aborted a load yes. in 92, uh, which they, I don't want to talk too much about it. I it was a sizable load, wasn't it? So to talk to me about how much was this, Michael? Well, allegedly they said it was, it was tons. Yeah, and you know from just their information, obviously it wasn't yeah. yours. Yeah, but it's, it weren't mine, we was helping, but they said there was tons of it. Yeah. And they, they drugged up in the fishing nets about two and a half ton. Mm. But the truth of the matter was, is it wasn't ours. Yeah. We was, we was assisting, yeah. And, but we went, crazily, I went on the boat that night, customs and excise was taking photographs of us. I went on there with a cracking guy, a European guy, he's a tough man. We stayed in a hotel the night before, and when he took his shirt off, he had a big barrel chest, but he had a crucifix. It was the size of his real sort of Catholic crucifix. And I remember taking it up, and it was like, a, like the mayor's sort of, what the mayor wears around it, it was massive. He put it on the thing, and he said to me, Michael, this is a gift from God, the cannabis. Yeah. So we had no investment in it, no outlay in it. We were trying to do a service which sadly, it got aborted. I went with him on the boat crazily. I, I sort of, I put a scarf around my head. The car we had wasn't registered to us. We, we parked the car miles away. But when we, I climbed over the fence at Swansea Harbour, um, not that it made any difference. I was sitting there taking photographs. It was, you know, they, they, they towed this boat in and, and it had been aborted. It like someone dying on there when I went on there. And it was these three sort of African guys there, and this this French guy I didn't know any of them. The guy I was with was screaming, "What's happened? What's happened?" You know, it was it cost them dearly, but something happened, and and it got whatever happened. I don't know because it wasn't mine. But they say it got aborted. So when I left there, I walked for miles to the car, foolish to go on the boat, but I was game. Uh, he wanted to go on the boat. The old man said, what are you doing? And so they took photographs of me. They didn't know it was me. And further down the road, come, coming out of Wales or going towards Devon on the M5, a squad card pulls up. And I thought, oh, blimey. They said I was speeding. So they then knew it was me. Yeah. Just trying to identify you at this point. Yeah. yeah. So I was a bit reckless there. But there was nothing that they could do. Did you clock this at the time? That it was sort of being suspicious and you getting pulled over or did you just try and justify it in your mind? No, I f at first of all I was obviously suspicious but I knew it wouldn't be them who was trying to nick me. It was just a uniform, two on a uniform. So I got out of the car, walked up to them. Um, I was not, I was going to give them a false name but I thought, hold on a minute, he's in the car. So the guy who was in the car not necessarily was the guy they see on the boat because I, I changed, yeah. They knew it was me, but they didn't know it was me, and they found out then. But they couldn't. It was nothing I'd done wrong, yeah. Nothing I'd done wrong, and they obviously let us go. We we heard that we had to be very very careful. Mm. We downed tools and we went back to Spain, and we and for a number of months we just chilled out and relaxed. And then it, and then it happened again, and this time we got, you know, involved. And um, well, I was arrested at gunpoint. Even then, the the weird addict in me, I was telling a story to a fellow the other day, right? So this will sum me up, yeah. From fearful to fearless, I was in a place in Tangiers, right, with. Some government help, and that's as much as I say about that. Two drug smugglers, because they don't think it's a crime out there. It's, it's like a commodity. It could be their, could be their coffee. It could be their gelaba. It could be anything. They don't think it's, don't think it's illegal. Um, and I don't think it should be illegal cannabis. But anyway, that's not what I want to get into. So we're there with this influential figure from London who had influence down in Morocco. Government official there, 
and these two Herberts, two Moroccans, and one of them, it was beer and meat, and I think there was a gun about. So I've gone in there, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and because it was a, a sort of a large bit of business, they expect you to, these Moroccans were, tr I'm not saying Moroccans aren't trustworthy, but these were very trustworthy and very friendly. And so you shouldn't ask to test the puff. We're having a formal meeting. So I said, oh, whatever I said anyway. No, 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 it's okay. So no, give me a thing. I want a puff, I'm an addict. So they're all looking at me, I roll a joint. And it was, a, it was that Poland and it was strong. It blew my brains away. So I thought, oh my God, what have I done? So I put my foot up on the windowsill and underneath this, there was a, it was like a, uh, a linen curtain. It was beautiful, this place. Right in the middle of the Casbah, it was a beautiful place. A mouse run across my foot. A mouse, isn't that big? I've jumped up and screamed. With me talking about this, this guy's dad's meant to be a bit tough. You've got the pilies of the world and he's sitting there, I'm a big guy and he's frightened of a mouse. I went, ah! And he went, what? I said, look, look, he said, what? I said, there's a mouse. They went, what? He's flying of a mouse. So, you know, it didn't go down well, but they obviously, I'd work with them and I don't think that, that discredited me. And that's not the point I'm trying to make. Three months later, when I was arrested at gunpoint, and I'm not saying I'm not frightened of guns, yeah, but I obviously wasn't stoned. I, I was about myself. And I'm talking about, there was a lot of, there was an armed force there, uh, that, whoever they were. They reckon there was, I think, I always get the number up, so I was 12 or 16 armed coppers, but night size, whatever they was doing, but we were surrounded. There were 17 of us near. Where was this? In uh, Biddeford, in Westwood Home, in, South De in North Devon. But everyone had been nicked, barring me and my co-defendant and the driver. Everyone was nicked, we didn't know, yeah? Only f a little while prior, but it, as they was bringing it off the boat, it come in, it was tidal. So we was meant to come in on the night, on the, on the night tide of the, um, of November the 7th. But the guy came in on the day tide. So when he bought the gear home, it was estrial, so the, the sea was out. So the, the, the boat was parked up on the floor of the sea. So we had to wait for the water to come in rise again um, and we thought we'd done everything right the only mistake i made and i put it out there i'm not saying that this mistake got us nicked but going on the boat and that mistake wasn't against anyone else it was a, it was derogatory against myself which was a, a foolish thing that i'd done but i'd done it but that never got us nicked they the observation went on for 18 months mm. a massive observation and so how big was this second load five tons well, they say four and a half time, but we think it was five. If you went missing? I'm not sure. But, but the point I wanted to make was when that policeman was in front of me with a gun, I, f I felt no fear. Not because I'm not frightened of guns. And I've often thought the mice and the gun, you'd think I'd be frightened of the gun. But that mice f spooked me. So once I've done a lot of my recovery, I started to wonder about that equilibrium. Mm. Why can I be frightened of a mice? I'm not saying I wasn't frightened of the gun, but I wasn't bothered. Yeah, the mind clearly wasn't right at them times there. You can see from those sort of... Bizarre behaviour. Mm. And I'm not like, oh, look, come and shoot me. I'm not saying that. It was how calm I was. And I sort of took it over because of my voice. Everyone, stop! It was pistol whipping Peter Bracken. Bless him, Peter. Alan Trotter was driver, he sort of collapsed. And they were, then they wanted me, Michael Emmett. I didn't put my hands on my head, I, I, was, I was very defiant. I was looking to pinch myself and saying, is this happening really? You're looking for a way out. Peter went to drive in the sea. He was a brave boy, Peter Bracken. And they just got me pissed, whacked me with a pistol, whacked me on the floor. And then the emotional trauma child come out. So I wasn't frightened, I was arrested. You can't do the time, don't do the crime. And the first thing that I thought about when I was on my backside on November the 7th, just after 12 o'clock, so November the 8th or whatever, all I could think about was Tracy and my three children. And I had tears. I thought, what have I done with my kids? Now that don't relate to an hardened criminal. 
And the guy said, a penny for your thoughts. And I told him to F off. I said, my three children. He went, what? He said, he's talking about his kids. I said, leave me alone. They took me to the police station. I didn't even give them my name and address. I can relate to that though, Mike. Because that's yeah. what I think about those points there and it really becomes clear. Like, fuck, and then the things that matter come clear in those moments where you should have been thinking about this the whole time. I was very much like this. Absolutely. And so, that's all I could think about was my, I adore my girls. I adore mm. my girls. And I haven't shown them that love in, in, in ways. I do down days. I was a very dysfunctional, broken, mental health issues yeah. young man. And um, so one of your codees was actually your dad in this case. He'd, yeah. he'd got back into life. So you said he sort of got out of it in the late 80s with Joe, but obviously yeah. he must have fallen back into it. Like we're a criminal, he was a career criminal, <coughs> we did no, no different. And so he was back into it. Yeah, well, he was, he was with me. He didn't do anything about his crime. He, he, he was my, he, he marked me card. I got a good introduction. Yeah. People trusted him. So that was his involvement, really. On no this. more than that. No, he wasn't hands-on with his. He was getting a financial gain. Exactly. So there was some. Yeah, of course. He, he, he was getting a good financial gain. Of course. You know, and, and and when we got arrested, I was gutted that he got nicked. Bless his heart. Yeah. But he did. He did. Bless him. And um, so was it remanded. Obviously, was something this big. It was straight on remand then for you guys. We should have been on the book. We should have gone to Bristol when yeah. they moved us from. Um, they moved us from um, uh, Westwood, I forget the name of the place down there, Barnstable Police Station. And when they moved us to the Nick, there was 17 of us. They let four go. Um, and there was 13 or 12 of us nicked. But me, Brian Emmett, Lamonier and Bracken was down to be on the book at Bristol. Yeah, I kid you not, they took us from Barnstable to Exeter with armed guards... Yeah, helicopter. They thought they was going to get Lamonier off the bus because the people behind this were noise. So Lamonier was a serious French figure then? Yeah. Definitely. Well, he, Where not, else was he from in France? He was from, uh, he was Basque. Oh, was, yeah. He was Basque, but he, he, he wasn't uh, a serious, he, he was a serious instrument in the operation. But he was more of a sort of a bohemian guy who they used. But behind him came a lot, a lot of big people who I, who I don't know. And so initially, you know, when you got reminded, were you sold up with your dad straight away then? Well, we were going to Bristol when they took us to Exeter, which is a local B cat. Yeah. I, I mean, I met the vicar. He, he retired, uh, Bill, Bill Burwood. He's a friend of mine, Bill. And I, I, I had dinner with him about four years ago on his retirement, and he was my chaplain. And when he was sitting next to me at the dinner table, he said, I don't know how you, your dad, Lamonier and Bracken, stayed at Exeter. You was red all over you. You was going to Bristol. Now, when they used to take us to court, mm. it would be armed guards over Lamonier's more so. Proper armed guards. I mean, it was like the IRA being moved. And this went on for a number of months until, but then I think what it was, it came out in the newspaper that what was attached to this, and I don't want to go into too deep about it, was a, a bank account in the Cayman Islands. I read it in the Sunday, in the Daily Telegraph. It was a cocaine cartel run. I'm not saying they was with us because they weren't. There was a bank in the Cayman Islands. There was a Moyet painting they found. They found copious amounts of cocaine and copious amounts of money. That had nothing to do with us, but it was attached to the story. So it was organised crime at American level, uh, at a European level. It was massive. And the people around it, I, I, I seem to have some acknowledgement that we was attached to the same transport and some of the people involved, and I don't want to name names or get in, but it was serious crime. So it was the cartels, you're going back 30 odd years, so they're all probably dead now. And then there was a massive cannabis operation, a lot more, I'm not going to say what it is, I'm not a kiss and tell guy, but it was organised crime. And I wasn't the organised crime, I was the crazy addict of the son of the man who knew everyone. And, and so there was an influence of my dad, Joe Pyle. You know, they had a good rep, them two boys. Uh, and then you start to see uh, people you have on a pedestal. 
that we're all human, we're all frail, we're all broken, we just cover it up better. But we've drink drugs and women and whatever. Mm. But I think we all suffer. Especially in the criminal world. Very much so. And so obviously for people like you don't know, you end up spending two years padded up with your dad. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to me about that and how that was and the most funniest time was that he never ever smoked cannabis, my dad, albeit a big old smuggler. He never smoked cannabis. And um so he um he's come into the cell one day and uh I can see he's stoned. He keeps poking his tongue out of his dry lips. And I, could, I can't remember the exact conversation, but I said, what have you done? He said, I've had a puff. And I got really nervous and frightened that he might have a wobble. How long were you actually on remand for in um, Exeter until you ended up getting... It was two years. On remand? Yeah. Bloody hell. It was a very intense case. The problem is, it was such a big case with so many codes. I can imagine it's a very complicated case. Did you all take it to trial? We all went to trial. But what happened was, because of the the background stuff that I was telling you before, the people I didn't know, the Moniers, you know, I'm not sure how well Dennis knew him, I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but it was obviously, you know, it came out in the newspapers. If it hadn't come out in the newspapers, trust me, I wouldn't be telling you. But, so it's documented evidence. Um, and so when, once they're convicted, they reckon they, over this story, there was an, a number of hundred people arrested a, around the world. So when I said about the Cayman Island, the banks and all what they found, you know, it was big organised crime. And I think we got attached to that. And because of my dad's, maybe his reputation, you know, it, 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 it blow it out of proportion. So when we was in the cell together, the old man never used cannabis. I started puffing with him, yeah. And, and saw a side to him, he started art and he, he, he started all things like he, was, he, he sort of enjoyed himself. And he'd done his prison sentence very well, the old man, mm. from, in my opinion, I thought he was great. So it was hard because I saw things about him that I didn't like. He probably saw things about me that, that, he, that I didn't like. I got involved with a couple of fights in there, he come and jumped in on the up here and I didn't really, oh I felt, a bit, felt a bit embarrassed. So, so he's a tough fellow, was the old man? Oh, yeah. That was his. That was his claim to fame. How tough he was. Yeah. He didn't feel pain, physical pain. Seriously, he didn't. He, he didn't feel physical pain. No. Emotional pain. He was. He was a baby. Mm. And so, talk to me about what. What sentence did you guys get then? So, so leading up to it. So. And how long was the trial? Sorry. Just, just well, this is what happened. Yeah. Sorry. No, you're all right. Go on. How long was the trial? Yeah, Christian? Indeed. So what happened was. With this stuff that was behind the scenes that wasn't, a, wasn't about us, it was an attachment that we had. When they all got sentenced, everyone got sentenced to brawl and whatever happened, then they revealed the story in the paper about what was going on behind us. There was an informant as well. We had a chance of getting out of it on the informant. A mate of mine got arrested for uh, about half a ton of puff. His evidence was that he'd met with me, so they wanted to find out about the evidence and they found out that it was an informant involved. It wasn't his informant, it was ours. In fact, they changed the law over it. Judge Barrington Black and another judge down in East London let my friend go and two people nick with heroin on this point of law over this informant, yeah? But they changed it. And what it was in the trials, if you could disclose that there was a, in the, un, in, the, in the evidence that wasn't shown and there was an informant, the prosecution could take that to the judge and say there's an informant in this case, we want him named. And the defence say, normally, we can't name him, we drop, so you're out of it. But with us, it, I'm not saying they've done it because of us, but it was a loophole in the law and it changed, it, it was white reported and got changed about three weeks before our trial. So you didn't have the the comfort of just saying to the judge, there's an informant, we want to see the undisclosed evidence, which then the prosecution would have to show, it would be, it would be slung out. And we knew that because a friend of mine got out on my informant, I don't know who he is. But they changed it, that the judge had jurisdiction not to invite the prosecution behind closed doors, just to see the, sorry, not the defence lawyer, the prosecution lawyer, 
and there was a way by law that now they didn't have to reveal the name, right? So we was running that course, you yeah. There was a DTOA of six million pound between the four of us. Um, that was a big fine. There was two importations we were charged with. One was two and a half ton, which they drugged up in the fishing nets, and one was four and a half ton. And they, and they was both linked with a conspiracy. So we was looking, and they could only give us 14 years, but with this fine, I think we'd have been doing about six years. I think we'd have been doing 20 years. I had a, <coughs> I had a, um, another thing, I've been arrested and I, I could have got another two years on that, but that was sort of wavered. So we went to the mercy of the court by them giving us a deal. So this was the deal that they gave us because it would have been a six month, nine month trial. The evidence of the trial behind us came out in the papers. So all the security stopped on us. It just went overnight. We was fortunate not to be Cat A prisoners. So it was starting to get a little bit easy. We was prosecuted by a guy who was the uh, one of the prosecutions in the Maxwell case, a guy called Garlic, and he was red hot. Anyway, they came with a deal, yeah? And I'm not sure whether it was to keep us away from running with the informant, um, which was proven to be difficult. The judge said in the trial that this should be a class A drug, it's a killer. One of the barristers jumped up of our, on our side and says, excuse me, Your Honour, the only way this could have killed anybody if it fell on top of them, right? And I laughed and he looked at oh, me. No. I burst out laughing. I just found it funny. Uh, uh, my barrister said, he's got the hunt with you, this judge. So we was down in the cells, about 13 of us. They sent my, uh, Jonathan Walker, who was my, my defence barrister. He was a lovely man. He was a great man, Jonathan. And he come down. Our, our solicitor was a little bit, he had, he had a bit of a reputation, Ralph Hines. Um, he was known to the police as a criminal lawyer. Um, and, and I think Ralph had sort of one or two tricks. Oh, God rest your soul, Ralph. I don't want to disrespect you in any way because his daughter's a leading barrister, I believe, today. But he was a good guy. And um, they came down. Jonathan called me to the cell. It was in this massive cell. There was arguments going on, what was right and what was wrong. Le Monnier was getting pressurised. My dad was angry, but he kept making out he was a didgering old man and he didn't know what was going on. He was playing his part, he was. So they come to the door. Jonathan Walker, and he said, they're offering you a trade. No bodies, nothing, we'd never, or anything like I mean, I never given my name for two days. We, that weren't our style at all. And I don't want to emphasize that. Yeah, for people who don't know, this is very, very common to avoid the trials, the, the prosecution offers sort of plea deals or lesser charges to avoid the trials, to avoid the cost, Absolutely. to avoid the time. So this is sort Absolutely. of just letting that sort of yeah. audience know. That, that was the deal. No bodies that don't even exist in our in our world. Um, it was hold your hands up for the importation of the second one. Not not possession. So they tried to say that me and my dad were we pulled up three million pounds to pay for the transport, which wasn't true. Yeah, it wasn't true. I mean, it would have been expensive transport. Well, it came a long way away. So it was a huge amount of cannabis. It wasn't just one ship. It had come from a long way away. This doesn't matter where it had come from. Um, well, it came from Pakistan, to be honest. If you're involved with the Moroccans and whatever it was, yeah, yeah. I don't want to go into too much detail. So there was organised crime. It was this. It was that. So to stop the trial, for us not to run with the informant, because. That was ebbing away from us, the way they changed the law. I hope that makes sense. Does it make sense? Yeah. So they came to the debt and he said, look, they're willing to give you, with a guilty plea, to stop the trial. They're going to squash the fine from 3 million to 400,000, saying that the cost of this gear in Pakistan was 400 grand or 450 grand, 50 pound a kilo, so they said. Um, they're going to waiver the 3 million quid they give you a 10. We've been on remand two years, so I said, and they're gonna drop the importation of the first one. So all we're left with is knowingly concerned about the importation of four and a half ton. So the three million pounds gone, the first charge is gone, there's a conspiracy gone, 
All they could give us was a max 14, as I said, plus the fine 20 years. So they're saying, I have a run with it. Well, that's the deal. So we have a chat. So we've done two years, another three years we could be on. Now we was looking at being home in 10 years, eight years, whatever it was. You halved it straight away. So we've halved it. So I said, listen, let's run with it. You know, if we fall, we fall. But if we run with it, we're home in three years. We do another art of stretching, extra, go up to the London jails, we'll be through the slips. So, um, sorry I speak in, in the language maybe people will not understand. No, no, it's all right. It's all right. It's, yeah, it's good talking in natural tongue. Yeah, thank you. Cool, you're a good interview, uh, Christian. I, I like the way you... I've been winging it, but I'm getting yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, amen, well done. So, what happened was, I my dad said, I said to Jonathan Walken, get the old man a seven. I'll t we'll take nines and tens, and we'll, we'll take the 400 grand between the four of us. So that was the deal. Anyway, they went back upstairs. Jonathan came back down and he said, um, look, Michael, it's not you. He said, yeah, you want your dad. They got the ump with your dad over Joe and him before, blah, blah, blah. They, they wanted him for ages and they got him. So he said, you better tell him. I said, no, you tell him. And he was only a little guy, Irish descent. He was angry, sod. So I said, look, Jonathan wants to talk. I can't remember exactly. Jonathan wants to talk to you at the cell window. He goes up to the thing. All hell broke loose. Yeah. He didn't like it. But he said, I've never, never, never fell to the mercy of these people. He said, I don't trust them. He said, we've got to be careful here. I said, Dad. Let's have a go. So he, I spoke him around. When we go into the court, not up until then, my dad wasn't the number one on the indictment. Peter Bracken was. So they tell the judge, the prosecution, that we're going to have to trade. So they changed the indictment prior to sentencing, and they changed the indictment to Brian Evan, Brian Emmett, and others. And he's looked. He thought they trapped me. They got me. So in these up in these summing up, garlic his name, no not garlic, I forget his name now, he turned around and said about my dad, you've portrayed yourself as an old jiggering old man, you know, you. I think he said you're about an uh, organisation of, of, of criminal activities, I think he said your arms stretch around the world, all things that helped my dad in an appeal, but he said a number of things that he, he raised my dad up in that court, as if to say, he's down to you. And he said, don't send, he said, don't stand up, because we was all in the jury box. Because there was 13 or 12 of us, I can't, one of the two. Lovely fisherman and his son, they were lovely people, these Dick Fishley, lovely man. Um, uh, Peter, uh, there, was, there was a fishmonger there. They was all genuine people. And he said to the old man, um, don't stand up. He said, I'll sentence you to 12 and a half years. And the old man jumped up and he went to the judge, you sentenced me to death, you dirty old bastard. He's turned around to attack Lamonnier because he blamed Lamonnier. There was carnage in the court, that got settled out. You know, we all settled everyone down. I think he went, I think he might have even smacked him. He'd done something to him, calling him all bad names. And then um, they sentenced me to 12 and a half years. And my two other co-defendants, principal organisers, we all got 12 and a half years and a 400 grand fine, and the subordinates got from nine to two years, I think. And that was us, weighed off. Mm. Down you go. And so how was the feeling that day after that? Did you feel like you'd been shafted slightly? No. No? I was, I was, I, was, I, was, I, I thought that I was going to be getting a yes. big sentence. I, I, was, I was sort of a little bit shocked. I was pleased to be out of fine, um, you know, that sort of money, or do six years, I think it was, I can't remember what it was. Um, and um, <laughs> so, I mean, there was anxiety attached, um, but I wasn't shocked. I didn't think, oh, what's happened to me? There's an old saying, isn't there? You can't do the time, don't do the crime. So there was that. And, but things began to change for me spiritually. I was going to say, so some pr it was actually prior to the sentencing, you'd actually start to find faith, isn't that correct? Isn't what it? happened, Christian, was because the, the, I'd left Tracy behind and I was with Daniela, yeah, and she was an Italian girl, very Catholic, and she was mates with Samantha Fox, 
who'd done a thing called the Alpha course, it's a, it's a Christian course at Holy Trinity Brompton in Knightsbridge. And because she was a bit of a celebrity, you know, the church sort of put her out there. Daniela was her friend. She weren't my, I said on a podcast, she was my friend. I knew Sam, but she was Danny's friend. Um, we got involved doing some charity work. She come to the Nick. Um, we had it all on film. We had Dan we had Samantha Fox in the prison at Exeter Prison, walking about the wig and being in the church and all that. Um, there's a funny story what goes with that, because there was a video and I stole it. Uh, and got it out on the out. It was a video of all of us dancing in the chapel. Um, the, court, the governor had the hunt with me there though. He had the raving needle with me there because I nicked it. I took it out on a visit. And uh, anyway, so what had happened was, Daniela was going to this church, Holy Trinity Brompton. They started to pray. There was a thing going on in Canada. They called it a revival. And I, I hated the word born again Christian. I hated it. And, uh, but I always had a faith in something else. Um, and I thought sort of faith was there to be, he was being punished. Uh, I, bought, I got brought up by a Catholic grandmother, who was great, my, my, my grandmother Mary. Dad used to go along to the church because he was old fashioned, Brian. It was an old fashioned belief that he had. So he used to go along to the church. He said to me, why don't you come along and sit at the back and be quiet on a Sunday morning. One thing led to another, I was a crazy addict. I was high on drugs in the prison. And, and, I, and I had a gaping hole in me that was broken from the trauma, the arguing with women, being volatile, having affairs, being completely insane. I really was mad. Today I'm not, and I really am not. I'm not there, but I'm getting there. And then so we phoned up the church. Um, Samantha Fox had come down and done, like I'd said, some charity work in the prison. We got, um, we got a snooker star to come down and do some charity work. I was keeping myself busy. Um, Sam came in the prison, it was all on the video. Like I said, I nicked the video, caused me a lot of trouble. You managed to knock the drugs on the head? Yeah, so how right was, How was that then, literally just? Right there, it was amazing. So this, this team came up from Holy Trinity Brompton. Yeah. And uh, there was a thing called Alpha. And this was the start of Alpha in prisons, which is now, gone around the world, There's, uh, it's in 900 prisons around the world, and many men and women in the prison system. It's, it's a non-threatening way of understanding the faith. You know, you, they don't punch it down you. They, they, it's very skillfully done where you can ask questions. And Nicky Gumbel is the head of the church. You've got the Paul Cowley's ex-prisoner, who's a vicar, beautiful Emmy Wilson. Um, and it's driven all around the world and people, I met a guy a little while ago who was on death row for 26 years in a Ugandan. He seen the course, he done it, got let out of prison, he was a political prisoner and he, he got his job back in the Ugandan minister, uh, 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 the Ugandan government. So you think, my God. So for me to have faith, so anyway, they come down from Holy Trinity Brompton they prayed this prayer, and, and anyone's listening, I'm not religious, I'm not weird, it just happens to be a reality for me. And they prayed a prayer, and something happened to me. My dirty soul got touched. And I thought, my God, this is real. So it was, asthma, it was in the atmosphere. Something changed in the atmosphere, and everyone felt it in the room, mm -hmm. everyone. My dad felt it. Um, he, he, he got the joys, Brian, he was laughing uncontrollably. And it was not the sort of thing that he would, would really do, Brian. His faith was, yeah, God bless you. Um, and we got touched and it started Alpha in Prisons. Uh, I've done a lot of work with Alpha in Prisons. I, I've been around the world sharing my experience, strength and hope. And this thing happened and it took off around the prisons. We'd done the first course in Swaleside. 90 people come on the course, all hard and criminals, all looking for something to change the way they change the way they felt. And I think because we'd done it, there was a bit of influence. People thought, you know, it was mocked, it was laughed at, but a lot of people done the first course in Swaleside. Um, but it was tough. It was tough tough proclaiming I was a Christian. 
And then I started to investigate how tough Jesus was because I was into tough men. And I started to realise whether he's the son of God or not, you know, he was killed, he weren't a grass, it was barbaric what happened to him, he wasn't frightened, he had the qualities of a good human being, yeah, which we all adhere to in the criminal world. I'm not saying Jesus was a criminal. I mean, when they say he was on the cross, there was two criminals with him anyway, he said he's out for us. But coming away from the religious side of it, the spiritual side of it, something happened to me spiritually, yeah. So people have this alternative spirituality to me because it was attached to the cross and Jesus. It made me understand it a lot more. I've always respected churches. I respect the Bible. Um, and this course just took off. And I started to go with it. It was hard in prisons. You know, my mates going, what are you doing? But it also enabled me to settle my addict because mm. I was clean now. And so it was a spiritual thing that was sort of helping me grow as a person. It's fantastic. So you've very much started and begun your process of self-healing, mm. trying to sort of deal with your trauma of the past mm. and on the right path. And like I say, you're in a prison where a lot of people want to hide their faults and fears <laughs> and stuff like this. So you're swimming against the current. You've found the strength at this point. Mm. And then so you spent the next few years in that prison centre sort of, sort of working with God and your spirituality and trying to help people and help yourself. Yeah, that came into it. I was, I was like a Bambi on ice, I was a new duck to water. But because I'd received the truth, in my opinion, you know, I, was, I, I felt like I was on the back of an aeroplane. Fantastic. And I'd found something, and, and I, it, it wasn't hallelujah, I'm saved. Um, I, I'd built up a defense me mechanism against people, against places. I was very angry, I was very upset. And the more frustrated I became, the beautiful love that my mother or God had instilled in me was being strangled. And I, and, and I used to talk to myself. I thought I was mentally ill badly. I really did. And that ain't a cop out. And then when I came out of prison, should I move on to that? Yeah, so you, you end up coming out of prison in, in 99, was it, or 2000? When yeah, just, just on the peripherals. I think halfway through the year, May or something it was. And... Um, Incredible that I got home. None of the other, uh, 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 the four of us, the principal organisers, I was the only one who got home. Brian never got home. Peter never got home. They all done nearly six, which was a touch anyway. But I'd just done under five, which was a miracle. And, um, but I came out of prison and I relapsed uh, within six months. And what was that, drink, drugs or crime? Uh, no, not crime, drink, drugs or crime. It was, it was, it was drugs, it was yes. cocaine. It spun me out of control. Old Michael appeared. I was ashamed. I had another affair with my best mate's wife, and I'm so sorry. Mm. I turned on Tracy. Yeah. She got the brunt of my aggression, of my... God, what a woman Tracy is. Oh, dear. What a woman she is. She got the brunt of my aggression. It got volatile. There was lots of screaming and shouting and things being thrown, and it was horrible. And I just, I, I, I went into this abyss of the prior thing that I'd done before I got nicked. It came on me again and, and it was so destructive. And I'd built a business, I had a, a radio station in Brighton. I was involved with supermarkets. We had a, we had, prior to Kasabian, becoming Kasabian, they was called Sarah Cruz. Yeah. I was a partner in those. I had a flower business. And I'm not showing off, but I was set up for life. It was like the pee in the mattress. And when I'd had the affair, it broke my friend's heart. She was a lovely girl I had the affair with. She suffered. Bless her heart. She suffered, this mm. girl. A lovely lady, my best friend. Oh, it was horrendous. And even he, I believe, still has a love for me. He knew the kindness of Michael, but once my addict's out, so, and the trauma that comes with it, so the dysfunction, I was back to square one. And I still didn't stop. I, I had a child with, a, with another lady, bless her heart, Joe, lovely Ruby, um, that was hard. And then I lost everything, I lost everything. 
So I was having this dual personality, still doing the prison work, still going to church, yeah. still going to meetings. I, I, I got out of the, the, the cocaine relapse, but I, just, I don't know why I couldn't make it. And then in 2007, <coughs> the crash came and everything I had, I lost. Someone stole a huge amount of money off me in a business. I went back, I can't say who they are. I went back to some very, very, very good people. And I think because I had credibility, but I was gone, I was gibbering. I lost all my homes, all my businesses. I borrowed money off of people who were my friends, who come from a sort of fraternity of people that you got to give the money back and quite rightly so. It's called heartache, it's called pain. I haven't robbed anybody. I've just, it got, you know, and a lot of people have had a lot of money back. I'm still in the process of paying it. And these are my family and friends. But in that, and I'm sorry to disappoint anybody, it helped me change even more. So I got clean again. I've, I've, I work in a homeless shelter. I do a lot of work with prisoners today. I've got four beautiful children. I've got seven and mate, well nine grandchildren, two are from a different marriage, but I've got seven amazing, amazing, amazing grandchildren who God has used to break my heart so it can function properly. Excellent. And what's your relationship like with your um, children at this point? Ah, uh, incredible. Yeah? My grandchildren and my children. Fantastic. My, my Tracy, all my ex-girlfriends, they're all supporting me. There's a, still one or two people who are upset because they haven't had their money back. But I say this in cameras, as God is my judge, my intentions is to pay every single penny. And I'm sorry that I made mistakes. I never stole the money. It was stolen from me. And, and can we speak about that for a minute? Absolutely. So talk to us about your book, The Sins of a Father, and when this came out, Michael. So I got approached by uh, somebody who... who lift it up slightly so we can show it to the camera. Fantastic. Hence the name. Yeah. So it's been endorsed by Ray Winston, Nicky Gumbel, who's the head of the Alpha, Eddie Richardson, a London crime boss, Paul Anderson, the kid on Peaky Blinders, and Reverend Canon Mike Pivolacci. I can't, he's an MBE. Mm -hmm. He runs a big uh, youth, Christian youth. So that, that came to me. And I felt like it's a book of amends. It's a book of hope. It's a book to say to everybody, I'm really, really sorry. And I think my sorries can only be concluded from the dysfunction by me behaving in a way that's acceptable. It took me a long time. Um, I don't do the things, I, I don't sleep with other people's wives anymore. I'm truly sorry what I've done. I, I, I'm not in any sort of volatility relationship. I, I struggle still with relationships. I, I'm loved by my children. I'm loved by my family and I love them. And I'm not selfish today. My addict was very selfish because it had to hide all the time. Mm. It took terrible liberties, but my never, thank God I never lost my heart. And my heart now is where I try to speak from rather than the dysfunctional brain. It's fantastic. Like I said, you speak so well. Thank and you. you've helped me just listening to you and then your other ones with Sean Atwood and James English. So people don't know, he has done a couple of other podcasts of late. And so I'm sure it's going to help hundreds, if not thousands of other people out there. So Please, I yeah. totally commend you Thank for you. telling your story. And um, so tell me where people can reach, where people can get the book from. Uh, is it on Amazon or...? It's a load of bookstores, but Amazon seems, because we're looking for data, if you want to buy the book, and if you enjoy it, it. Website, where can they find it? Where's the best place to get it? Amazon. Amazon, okay. Yeah, and also you can follow us on, on Instagram if you want, on um, Michael Emmett Official. And we, there's a story going on. We're trying to create a charity. We're trying to create a community-based where people can get the help I've got. It's not a joke. Yeah. This is not a con. We're not looking for anyone's money. We're looking to build. We've got chances of documentaries. We've done the Brick Box thing about Ronnie and Reggie Cray the other day. There's talk of a documentary about the prisons. There might be a chance to do other stuff. And we want people around us who are like-minded, who are in recovery, who want to find faith, or who don't want to find faith, but want some hope, want some fun. And I pray at the end of the day that I can surround myself back with my children and my grandchildren and my family, be out of debt, and, and, and live a life of faith and enjoy my days 
the autumn of my life. I'm 62 years of age. I don't want no trouble with no one. I just want to pay my, clear my name, which is being cleared. I'm very grateful for all the friends and family who've supported me. But if anyone's listening and you think there's no chance of getting out the hole you're in, no matter how deep you're in it, get around good people find a church or find recovery or find like-minded people we prisoners and addicts what we suffer from we don't know how to receive love mm -hmm. and love is a verb is an action it's a doing word it's not oh that girl's got a pretty face or i fancy that one or love is it's an action of, of compassion it's an action of caring it's an action of doing and the most important thing is we, learn, we need to learn to love ourselves because mm. we're all broken people trying to get well. Amen. Well, so fun. And so you said the people who want to reach out to you, Instagram's the best way or about Facebook and stuff like this, you're on Facebook as yeah, well? Yeah, they platform we're doing it. But if they want to follow the journey and find out what we're doing, they can follow So guys, I'm going to put all these links below in the description. So please click on the links, support Michael, reach out, get his book and get in touch with him. Thank you. But I'd like to uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. It's been very enjoyable. And uh, like I said, hopefully it's going to help a lot of people out there. Is there anyone you'd like to give a shout out to friends or family or people that have helped you or people that... So many, everyone who knows who's helped me. Uh, Just too many to mention. Russell, Adam, loads of them. Everyone who's helped me, trust me, it won't be in vain. And there's, there's a lot, been a lot of heartache, but I'd like to give a shout out on this podcast to Tracy and say thank you, Tracy, for all that you've done. And, and thank you for being such a good friend of mine. And I, I thank you, Tracy, like you can't believe. God bless. Well, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, hopefully we could do a part two at some point and show you the journey you've been on Amen. down the line. Thank Can you. I just shout out someone else? I, I've been seeing this young lady, she's a New Zealand lady, she's going back to live in New Zealand uh, and she's been a very, very dear close friend to me and she's done a lot for me, her name's Sarah and um, she works with a young um, Down Syndrome girl called Catty and Catty and Sarah have been massive in my recovery in the simplicity of being kind and friendly so I just want to give a shout out as well besides Tracy rock of ages jonathan aiken who wrote in the book as well he's the fallen mp wonderful man i want to say thank you to my church i want to say thank you for everyone who supported me and and catty i want to say this to catty you're very very special catty and i want to thank you for everything you've done for me god bless you.